Okay, uh, so this is a talk I gave uh, two weeks ago at our team meeting, at the JHU team meeting on Tuesday. And I was asked to give it again, basically, and I added a couple of items to it. So it's about uh, the experience I had um, implementing the protein protein interaction pipeline I was working on. So that's a pipeline which was initially written in C++. It had some um, fixed paths in there, some old code. It's, it's from um, 2013. And I um, had, we had the idea to re-implement it on Galaxy and then apply it for uh, different genomes and particularly also for SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so uh, just a brief overview on what this pipeline does is basically it takes a, a pair of sequences, sequence A and sequence B, and then it does a homology detection. Basically in the simplest way one could imagine uh, it as sequence alignment to a non-redundant database where we have sequences and structures. So once we match the sequence, our sequence A, fit it to another sequence of which we know the structure, then we can use that structure to create a model, basically assuming that if the sequence is similar, the structure will be similar too. That's basically uh, protein structure modeling at first for individual proteins. The approach in this way here, what it does is it also predicts complex structures. So initially we predict the individual proteins, predict their structures, and then we look further in the PDB database for um, monomers or hits, which are involved in any kind of complex with other proteins. And then we try to match our two individual proteins to one of these complex structure, basically use it as a, as a multi, uh, multimeric template for a complex structure prediction. The approach works on a genomic scale, but what it requires is that we pre-process the PDB database. So previously, I used the approach on a local cluster. So I had a shared directory. I could just download the entire PDB and access it from every node. I could um, access the directory structure, however I saw fit. Of course, in Galaxy, things are a little bit different. Uh, they have to be adjusted. We have to have the libraries. And we went through a couple of iterations, also a lot with Bjorn's help, to make the PDB available in an efficient way and to be able to access these currently 170,000 data sets quickly uh, with our algorithms. But that's the main approach. So we, we, see, we uh, find a match in the PDB70 database. It's a database, 60,000 sequences approximately with less than 70% sequence identity to each other. Then we get these monomers here and we get several hits, right? There's a, this is a top ranking one, but there might also be other similar ones. And some of the other similar ones, as we can see in this uh, figure here, are involved in protein complex building. Those are the gray ones. And then we do this individually, and then we try to match our top ranked monomer from sequence B to this, for example, here, the binding partner, which we identified through threading to sequence A. And it's then when we have pre-computed uh, PDB and all the relationships, Basically, it involves a lot of sequence alignments. So I use Cyblast 2 to create this index to find um, similar partners. And it works with Cyblast. Cyblast is great, of course, fantastic algorithm, of course. But if the sequence identity is very low, let's say less than 40%, that's what usually is commonly where the gray zone starts or, or where it gets like uh, the matches get worse then um, it's not so successful. But since I have a PDB70 database, so I know it's 70% sequence identity and the rest, which I haven't matched, has more than 70%. So Cyblast works pretty well. But for this threading here, for the initial threading, we use HH search, which is more sensitive. 
Okay, so then I find the partners and I do a structural alignment using TM align. Basically match TA1 here to TB1 and use one of these complex templates to construct a final model. That's the approach. And if it's successful, we get uh, we can use our uh, NGL viewer in um, Galaxy and visualize our structure, our hit. And this is what you see here. Um, the colors, they are like the, the, the red one and the blue one is, for example, your structural template from the PDB database. And the yellow one here is the individual model produced for sequence A. And the cyan color here is the individual model produced for sequence B, and they are matched on this complex structure template from the PDB. And you can see um, that the match is very good in this case. Then we get energy terms for it. And as I said, we can apply it on genomic scale and it works pretty well. We made some experiments to validate the method and compared it to experimental methods, to a variety of experimental methods using the Biograd database. It's also tools which are all available in Galaxy and per performs comparatively well. Um, but there were quite a few challenges to transfer this pipeline to Galaxy. And one of the challenges was the general tool update process. So what I did is I rewrote all the scripts in, in Python with less dependencies, much more readable, of course, and um, it's much easier also to modify and much clearer. And it was possible because I knew exactly what I was looking for. The C++ program I had before had many more variations, different ways of testing things. But when I re-implemented everything in um, Python, it took, of course, a while, but it was fairly quick because I knew exactly what I was looking for. Uh, okay, so the tool update process, however, is tricky. And it's it's like, I hope you guys don't see it like it's just complaining in this. This is just to, to mention these things. Some of these things are necessary. So we might not be able to improve upon just uh, on how the infrastructure is logically. And maybe, but there are others where we can improve on. I mean, it's just a listing uh, unopinionated in some way. So that was initially my tool update process. So. I update my Python code locally, and then I have to go to my local directory, find these uh, miniconda files, I'm using my Mac for it, and update those files manually. And the directory is pretty cryptic, it's fine after you know which files are actually used, but there are duplicates in the miniconda directory, there may be like three of them, and they might be also in different locations. And you have to find the one which is actually used when you run your local Planemo, Planemo test and your local instance. So I had to find these files, uh, modify them manually, then uh, run and test, of course, my local instance. And then uh, the process was, and Bjorn helped a lot with that too, um, that also points out to that there was basically two people required to do this and someone like Bjorn, who's uh, for, of course an expert on it. So that might be challenging for others. That's why I mentioned it, um, to find a Bjorn to help. So we create the conduct packages, that's step four. Then we push the conduct PR and merge it. And then we update the tool repository and push the tool repository PR to GitHub. Then we wait until the tests pass. Then we may merge the PR uh, we update the tool in the tool shed, which is now automatically part of the script, which Bjorn added to it. And then we install the new tools on the instance, and then we execute the tools. So that's 11 steps. And then when we notice anything is wrong, uh, there are some issues. Um, for example, runtime, some files might be too big. We change the data sets. Whatever you change, you have to go entirely through the process again. And uh, that can be cumbersome and delaying. Okay, let's look at a couple of things I uh, run into uh, while I was doing this, particularly working with collections. So collections are of course excellent. They let you track your individual data sets. They allow you to paralyze your computation immediately while everything is tracked and uh, you have nice access through the history. And that works fantastic. 
But if you have more than 20,000 entries, like genome sequences, let's say the human genome, about 20,000 uh, protein coding genes available in the Uniprot database, then um, your collections get really slow. And initially, I worked a lot with collections, but then I started reducing it. And I will show in the next slide how, because it got really slow, the histories got really slow, and it was basically, I had to click and then wait. And if you already start off with 20,000 sequences, then your next data set or your next step in the workflow will also have possibly um, 20,000 outputs and so on. So you continue to iterate this collection, which I don't do anymore because um, it just makes it impossible to work with. And it makes it also impossible to schedule the workflows. God forbid you make a mistake scheduling one with a parameter or you want to try another option, then you'll be uh, lost. Uh, another thing is collection cannot be easily imported. So for example, I started off with one history. I noticed it got slow. I wanted to start at a new with a new history, but I want to um, just pick one of the collections out of it so I can start fresh with, with like, let's say two collections of 20,000. That was not really possible. Even when we copy data sets, we have to basically copy the URL and either upload it again or use a multi-view. The multi-view, um, of course, cannot handle so many data sets right now. Okay, so collections were an issue. So what we did is found a workaround. Uh, it was a common workaround. We didn't reinvent it. It's a very simple approach. You basically, instead of producing a collection, you produce one big file where you concatenate all your data sets into, and then you create an additional file, the FF index file now, which contains the entry name, which has three columns. First column contains the entry name. Second column contains the location of the data set. So where was it concatenated into your FF data file? And the third column is the size of the data set. So by converting the PDB into um, these FF index FF data pairs, we now could easily run the tools actually. So the current pipeline uses both. So it uses the collections to do the threading because that helps paralyze it. Otherwise it wouldn't be possible probably to do it like in an efficient manner. Once the first threading results are there, which is the largest part of the computation, so threading sequence A against the PDB70 in this case, so it takes the most time. Once that collection has been produced through the parallelization, and that worked really well on uh, main, I know we had some adjustments for that too. Um, Nate worked on it, Marius too, he added something to it to allow us to actually quickly run these and they work pretty well once that collection comes out there i turn it into an ff index ff data pair and continue working with this individual file because for the consecutive steps i don't need parallelization and if i do which we also run into then uh, i split the ff index ff data pair into two or three or five and do it that way Okay, so what this also requires is tools, which we had to add. To add it to it, it's uh, called dbkit ff index. And those tools basically allow you to merge, uh, create these pairs, merge two of them, split them into um, basic collection like operations on this individual uh, files, which initially un, um, uncompressed the file was 150 gigabytes, but we move forward and compress the file. So that points out to this thing that when we develop tools for Galaxy, in my case, it was easier. Fortunately, I took that route early to rewrite it in Python. I think it made it much easier. I think I would have many more problems if I wouldn't have done that, particularly considering the updating process and you have C++, you have to compile it, you have different dependencies and so on. So, so fortunately, uh, I started very early to rewrite it. And it points out that uh, tools have to be sometimes customized for Galaxy. Galaxy itself pushes you to write tools better, 
right? With less dependencies, with clear parameters, it's like a clear interface and so on. But if the tool is not in that state and you want to do more complex things instead of just running it, um, then it might be consideration for other people to, to just rewrite it. <clears throat> Some of my tools require downloading large directories. So that has been separated. So the data acquisition has been separated from the algorithm itself into modules. So everything comes with pros and cons. Uh, thing I noticed is that log files are sometimes not visible and that differs on usegalaxy.eu and usegalaxy.org. So there are already, since I ran both uh, the, the, the pipeline on both systems, I already noticed differences, several differences. So that's one. And that's an issue on, um, I understand uh, in the context that it's a security issue, that's why the log files are not visible while the job is running. Even if you flush your data into it, you cannot see it in, the, in your interface. Newsgalaxy.org, you can see it. And that's very helpful because if you have a long job, uh, which might take a day or two even, which is not a problem because you have to do it just once, let's say the indexing. So it's possible to paralyze it, but it's unnecessary and adds additional complications to it, possibly. Um, then you are blind because you're not seeing anything until the job is complete. Whereas otherwise you could directly detect issues, right? Continuously, like let's say, take a look every, every 10 hours, see everything is still straight. You can't do that. Uh, we do have user interface bugs, um, several. We have the paper cuts of the zero are aware of it. Many of these things are uh, related to this challenge between adding new features, making changes. I mean, Galaxy is continuously being developed. Uh, we continuously provide new elements, but sometimes that comes with consequence and added price. Particularly if new features are added, I feel that we sometimes, and, and um, I'm guilty of that too, possibly, that we sometimes push a new feature, although it's not entirely ready, and then say, okay, we will go through the cycle and we have two weeks to fix things. Sometimes the consequences to resolve these issues because the planning was not done right um, takes much more time even than that. And that's an issue and it holds us back because if we make additions to certain components or modules or things like that, um, and we just push it into the code, it might lead to the fact that new additions will have much harder time just on how it kind of locks in the code. So you have to go back, redo what was done, at least the last things to re restore the modularity of certain things. And of course there are uh, as many opinions about how it should be done as there are developers. But what I noticed particularly for this challenge was to uh, sharing histories, for example, did not work right for large histories. So you click and you don't get any response. Your sharing URL is not there. You don't know what's going to happen. And then you have to check about 10 minutes later and see there your history has been shared, but the user interface doesn't respond. And we know why this happens is because, and we have, I know the working groups are working on solutions for that. Um, the backend group too, we need like a different infrastructure because right now we make these API requests and we cannot wait for a response because the history is too large. So it will take too long. So it will time out and you won't get a response. In the toolset installation, for example, we have the same issue, but we resolved it differently. We submit a, let's say a tool installation request and we don't even look at the response, forget about it and make a separate um continuous request to the database to see what the actual installation status is so we separated the two things but that's a uh, workaround would work here too it's probably common to do that but we will have better approaches as far as i understand the the strategy of the of the backend group right now okay so basically in the direction of web sockets something like that Okay, we, we do have new workflow editor features. Um, sometimes they lead to bugs in unexpected places. What I notice is, for example, changes are not always detected. So a simple feature like hiding or disabling the save button 
which is cool because you don't want to see the button if you can't save anything. But that requires also that we really catch all the changes which are possible and tag that correctly. What happened a couple of times, you change something, the save button remains disabled. Um, and then you have to kind of shift a note, for example, to trigger this change. There's also a tooltip with a tooltip issue with the save button. It's a paper cut. Both of them are paper cuts, but still you run into these uh, and it can be annoying or I mean, particularly from the perspective of someone who's kind of new to it for for us or for me after a minute it's clear there are some things i don't do and i know how to work around it but how to, how to work around it another thing is outputs can sometimes only be marked um, as outputs after reloading so you insert a note and it's a bug i'm actually working on but it's a reoccurring bug which we solved and i believe due to other changes uh it got surf surfaced again uh, so you add a note and you can't tag it so now you save it, reload it, then tag it. You cannot navigate back in Galaxy. Um, so we do have routing issues. You can't just press the back button. It's not going to work. And of course, maybe it's not possible for it to work everywhere, but um, it's something which would just make it much more intuitive if we would get that right. There are some new features, like we use view makes sense, and we have some issues with it. Uh, console errors. So I put this in here because JavaScript is very sensitive, as we know. So if there is an error somewhere, even unrelated, it might interrupt your 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 code, the code which you are actually running. So there might be conflicts. So we have obvious um, errors even in the console sometimes. Okay, invocation scripts and accessibility. I know we put some work in. Some of these issues are known. Uh, so. Invocation grids currently display all invocations. If you have a lot of invocations, you have to wait until it's finished, like until you can actually access the page and get slower and slower every time you run a new workflow. Uh, history grid becomes inaccessible. Again, you click and you know it, you just wait. Don't do anything else. And then it will appear after a while, but um, it's an issue. Uh, deleting history content takes a lot of time. Sometimes requires just deleting individual items. Um, it's it's uh, and you have to delete it. Intuitively, I would like to sometimes just delete something and really make it disappear. But to make sure it's not there, it's not indexed, it's it's just really gone. I understand that we want to keep want to keep data available and we tag it as deleted, but that doesn't solve the issue that uh, if you run into performance issues that still might affect it. So it would be nice to just really delete and gone if that's something we would consider. So there were some toolshed issues got also much better over the, over the last years, but there were still some. Uh, so for example, in your step, I don't remember eight or nine, when you push it to the, to the toolshed, your tool repository gets updated but there might be version conflicts sometimes you just really fix something very minor and you don't always maybe that's the wrong approach maybe i should always update the version but uh it would just accumulate so many versions through this iteration process that i rather don't do that so what can happen is there might be delays for your tool shed repository to become available there might be uh, version conflicts and sometimes you have to just change the version or change something else and try it again to trigger this refresh. So that's an issue. I had initially plenty more issues. I don't have any anymore. And one issue was because I think when we switched from Python 2.7 to uh, 3, that um, there were quite a few conflicts. Like I, my approach was to remove everything, just switch the whole thing to Python 3 cleanly and then add Python 2. And now I can know how to switch between the versions in case I need to look at an older release or something. But overall, that was mostly a Python 3 issue. And there were some very cryptic errors. So tool dependency handling didn't work. So basically, I run the tool. Everything goes through. But when I, I mean, I run, I run plenty more and like start up my instance and see the tool and everything looks fine. But when I run the tool, it just says it couldn't find that dependency and there were no errors or anything. And the solution was to just 
remove all my Miniconda, remove my Python versions manually, and then just start installing everything fresh. So that was an issue. Uh, job runtime limits, it's an interesting uh, topic, I think. So of course we need these runtime limits because it allows us to control the compute time and um, you make the most of our infrastructure by using it efficiently. Um, but it also can force you to paralyze jobs which you don't want to paralyze. And what I notice is that there is a difference. Use galaxy.eu has a 30 day limit, which works great. I think no job should run longer than that. For use galaxy.org is 60 hours. So if I have a job which takes two or three days, because like, let's say the PDB, I want to, in, I want to index it once, don't really care if it takes three days or even four, it doesn't really matter. And uh, then you have to go and create a workflow and paralyze it in order to get it running. And that increases the complexity and redundancy too, because when you um, paralyze it, you might end up having to do duplicate computation in certain parts. For example, for the indexing of the PDB, you need to create the Cyblast database first to run against, and every job needs to create that Cyblast database. It takes, in this case, only maybe five to 10 minutes, but still, uh, it just adds to it. So looking at zip files, um, we made an addition to these FF index, FF data pairs, now allow also to um, deal with zipped entries. Initially, I didn't do that because I want to keep it simple. So when you concatenate your files into this FF data, a uh, large uh, blob of a uh, single file, basically, you can now also use zipped entries. So you can pack your files and then push them in there. Of course, it saves a lot of space, Currently, the PDB um, from 150 dropped to 30 gigabytes, which is very common that it drops by a factor of five for text compression. Um, and we had to adjust the tools again, right? Because now our tools operate on these FF index, FF data pairs, which are zipped. So that caused a couple of more iterations to get that going. Um, problem is that the user has no control when uploading these files, that's another issue. So when you upload a zip file, it would just get unpacked. But when you have a log file locally, then you can use actually the packed file. So that means that if you have test cases, you have to distinguish between upload files and log files. So that add, adds additional complexity, of course, and it's kind of unintuitive to a certain extent that we cannot upload a zip file and say, keep it as a zip file. It causes quite a few issues. Um, on the other hand, I understand that feature. Initially, it sounds like it's intuitive. If you upload it, it gets unpacked, but there is some weakness there. And we also have limits on job output files, I think. Um, I haven't hit that limit anymore just because I avoided it, but I remember that I hit it. There was a huge zip file and I just needed four gigabytes of it, but the file itself was bigger than, it was 40 gigabytes, but then when it gets unpacked, it's much more. So I couldn't upload that file. I had to locally, I had to download it on my local machine, grab the files out there and just upload what I needed. Okay, Conda packages, of course they are great for versioning and helps a lot to have these uh, specific environments where our tools run in, makes everything so modular. Uh, so no critique, they're definitely necessary, but um, it requires just additional, it's quite a few additional steps. And this is basically a summary again of, of the first 10 steps. And um, there might be, as I said, server specific limitations even, which I ran into and um, it makes it difficult to debug the code, to figure out what's actually, what went wrong on the server and then kind of reproduce or guess what it was locally and then go through the cycle again can be very frustrating for, for someone who's uh, new to it. Okay, the Jenkins testing is great. Bjorn helped a lot with this. He basically wrote it, like added the necessary files to automatize them and it's extremely helpful. It made life much easier, but uh, still the testing is sometimes cryptic and unstable. And for someone who is brand new, I don't know 
I didn't see the tutorials. I'm not sure how that person would be actually able to go and produce these files to have this automated testing. I mean, it's very specific to our infrastructure. Um, basically, the idea is to probably copy it from an existing tool or from an existing repository and then make the adjustments. But it's not something really possible for someone else. So it's, it's a block there. Selenium tests, of course, failing. They, when they fail, they be very cryptic. They are difficult to find, to read, and to resolve. So that requires quite a bit of training to get through that. Um, okay, log files versus data sets, uh, data, sets, data set size limits, of course. As I said, um, log files are great. And I know we work on additional approaches on improving our data management for these large files. Uh, and I think we have to, because if someone really works with Galaxy and has to manually create these files or make sure that they exist, and there's no way of uh, getting them into the system without having an admin, um, at least on a public instance, I mean, on the local instance, you're your own admin, um, but that's that's a challenge, and we do have we do have the history right, and we do have library files, and we do have the log files, but there is like some conflict. Initially, intuitively, if I would be new, I'd be saying, okay, the history didn't work, I'll do it through the library. But that doesn't work either, so that's an issue. So the data management part is really important. Okay, and this is um, like other issues I run into. In my last slide is that I noticed that sometimes workflow step orders, they fail. And I think I know why it's specific situations where a job actually starts running before the input of the other job has been generated, which shouldn't happen, but I can pretty much reproduce it. I dug a little bit deeper and then left it there for now. Then, as I said, copying data sets even can be challenging. Our grids have generally issues. So for example, if you have uh, start your workflow and you want to cancel it, I don't know how well it works. Ideally, you'll be an admin and you can go to the admin interface, then have to access the jobs uh, table there, which is also, since it shows all the running jobs, can be really slow. And then you have, it's, it's just not easy to just say, okay, I want to cancel this workflow or at least the continuous steps just take them out, it's, it's tricky. And then while your jobs are in there, you can't do anything else, right? Okay, and as I said, differences in local behavior sometimes, and what a big challenge, and this summarizes it to a certain extent, is that we often, for approaches like this, we compete with specialized servers. So, of course, they are entirely inflexible, but for someone who says, okay, I want to do this now, he can just go to a server, has a simple page, upload his two sequence, press OK, and, and get an email when the results are there. So we have to, in certain ways, get closer to that simplicity. And overall, with the improvements, particularly the contributions of Bjorn, getting the log files there, having everything um, zipped, before, because initially I, I had one script, this DB kit create script is also able to download entries from sources. So I literally downloaded the entire PDB just to get this job running. Uh, initially, that was my approach. Fortunately, we don't have to do this anymore. So that's not a worry. So if someone really runs this workflow, he should be fine. Um, so it's very efficient now. But yeah, that's my that was my experience. You guys have any questions, comments? Sorry. We put a lot of comments in the chat. Okay. Uh, yeah. I just had the full screen. Okay. Okay. Wow. It's a bit. Uh, it's it's a lot of things. I don't know if we like maybe we want to go through the slides and see if something can be distilled or. I mean, there is a lot of comments to be made, but I don't know if there's a point doing it because <laughs> it'll be a few hours then. Uh, well, uh, Sam, uh, we need to put this slide somewhere that is accessible. 
Yeah, so. I just pushed it into the chat, but I will. Chat is very, you know. Galaxy Lab, maybe. Uh, yeah, Galaxy Lab, maybe. It also has no memory, really. But uh, OK, well, we'll see. It's just when we plan, for example, next uh not quarter but the four month period we need to look at this again and for all the um paper cuts yeah yeah i think wolfgang did make i mean really quickly wolfgang made this point too that i mean as a power user the multi-history view just doesn't work and if you need to copy a collection into a new history, you can just use the copy data sets um, option, and that works a lot better. But is it faster? I mean, I, I mean, well, the multi history you just doesn't work at some scale, right? Um, yeah, I don't will know. It be, will it be better with the new history? Or that doesn't fit into the multi. I mean, not right now, but it would work much better. If we had the multi history view like that, but I don't know if for copying data sets, the multi history view is, I don't know. Yeah, I still don't think it's going to be your best way to copy data sets, right? Yeah, with, when, you, when you just use the copy data sets interface, it's explicitly in a, a, a specific operation of uh, complexity one instead of showing all your histories and, you know, uh, the whole thing. Yeah, does it yeah. support copying uh, collections? Yeah, How do you it should. It? Yeah, it does. it does. Okay, cool. Maybe it should be renamed then, I guess, potentially is the confusion then. I don't know. Copy items or something. I mean, there's also, um, we've added or did we add it? But, you know, we have the idea to have a new history switcher picker um, so maybe one idea would also be that you can just, I don't know, have a copy button or control C or command C or whatever you have, you select whatever you want in your history, you switch your history and you do control V as a sort of, you know, oh, that yeah. might be the fastest actually, way to do stuff. We didn't I was make actually wondering if we should generalize that history picker with the history contents picker that Sam made uh, a year or so ago, right? And just have one universal picker um, modal, right? That you could pick histories, contents, um, and the, the, the props would determine what it shows, of course, but yeah. then you have a single I mean, consistent interface for choosing artifacts in Galaxy. Yeah. I mean, for, for this particular, for the data sets, it would be maybe intuitive to just if we can do it directly in the history, right? You you see the data set, you click on it, you get the option and it says, does it actually do that? It says, copy this data set to another history. And then you just um, get either an interface or whatever, however, a select field, and then you just specify the history and the data set is copied over there. I think that's the idea with the batch operations, right? Okay. I mean, or maybe that is something that we can add to the batch operations where, you know, you filter stuff in your history and then you can do actions on them. Right, right. I think that'd be the best. It is in the list of operations. Okay, cool. And then I think for me personally, the biggest challenge was the large data sets to deal with them, to get them in there. I mean, maybe I can say a few things about that. So I think your FF index thing, I mean, it's not a workaround. That's the way to do it. Um, like, you know, we can make dealing with 20,000 data sets in the history faster uh, to some degree, but I don't think there's a point having each individual protein as a, as a data set um, in Galaxy. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't, I, I really think that's the way to do it. Right? Okay. Um, we should aim for being able to process as much as possible and and the individual data sets are sort of the way that we do map reduce and things like that. But um, like, it's not, I mean, it's, there's a limit to how many things we can reasonably do because all of that also leaves traces in the database. Um, right. So I, mean, I, mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think, I think is having that, indexes is exactly what, what you would do in this situation. Is yeah. that yeah. something that we could just transparently? Like we have a option 
don't keep track in Galaxy of all the data sets and uh, where you submit the, what you normally map over, it, instead it does the FF index uh, thing, run the, modify the command to, to do the explosion on, on, on the cluster or whatever. And then- I mean, that's, that's actually super similar to the old task framework, right? That we abandoned. What, the task framework? That, the, that the we first, had years ago, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first incarnation of that would take a big file, rip it into n number of pieces and then run the same job on I mean, that's exactly what it did. And it threw away all the metadata because you most of the time didn't need it. Um, I mean, it was it was not, never great. I, I wrote it, so it's okay to say that. But um, I mean, that was kind of the, the gist there. Yeah. And I think like a data type driven way to do this, I mean, it, it totally makes sense, I think. Um, and I combined it too in one point that um, basically having a collection of these pairs 10 of them, right? For if, if I need 10 uh, job runs. But maybe the question would be, is the current integration of handling these FF index, FF data pairs, um, is it fine or should it be more integrated into Galaxy? Because right now it's just an additional tool, but maybe that's fine. Because collections are of course, I mean, native to Galaxy. This is just like, an, a tool, but that's maybe not that critical. It wouldn't just make it more, maybe easier presentable. And then the other question would be, I mean, I brought this up a couple of times, but so 20,000, if that's the limit, I mean, we don't want to make a statement and say, don't use more than 20,000, right? It's up to the people and they're going to run into it and figure it out. But sometimes the question is, would it not make sense to say, okay, this is too large. Do you want to split it up into sub collections or like into these pairs? That's a good, that's a question. I mean, I think what you have to sort of round about keep in your mind is that in most cases, one data set corresponds to one job. So mm -hmm. from there on, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there is an automatic way that you can say, you know, keep them together or split them. Um, uh, so I think, um, yeah. But I also wouldn't say that 20,000 is the limit, right? Um, it depends what you're doing. Uh, so I think overall the, the throughput on a good healthy galaxy system is, you know, for creating jobs, it's about uh, 60 milliseconds per job. And so you, you can make the calculation for 20,000 data sets. Um, if that runs serially on a single thing, that's 20 minutes, right? So that means uh, if you schedule a workflow and you reach a step that creates 20,000 jobs, that's going to take 20 minutes at this point. Um, Maybe it's not too bad. If the interface kind of works still and is fast, then it might be fine, right? Yeah, so the other thing is that we're going with uh, salary and background tasks. So right. precisely that, you know, when these things take a long time, you just send them to the background, you get back a uh, task ID that you can check, you know, what's the status currently. So that's, I think that's, that's the main reason we're going to do salary and, uh, Apart from this, it also allows us to parallelize over, you know, these 20,000 things um, because you can, I mean, a lot of it can be broken down. So you can, you can run that in parallel and, uh, and these tasks, I mean, they're not as heavy weight as running a full galaxy process. So you can also run many more of them than currently is possible with a handler. Uh, you can also limit them because I think one thing that you haven't noticed, but other people have noticed is that they're waiting for your uh, workflow steps to, to schedule. Uh, so if we break this down into smaller pieces and we put certain rate limits on it, which again is something that this gives us, uh, yeah, we would be in a position where, I mean, we can handle this easily and we should be able to go higher. Uh, there is also still optimizations left to do that are not terribly hard. Um, but also we're reaching sort of, I, th I think, you know, overall it's probably 
about 10 times more efficient to create jobs for large collections than last year. And maybe there's another 10 fold in, in it that is doable, but after that it gets hard to make the individual thing faster. I mean, and that's always excluding uh, some weird performance bug that can always happen. Um, I really think it's the interface, to be honest. I think from, I mean, if, if the interface would play along as like you said, with these ideas and the salary uh, workers and so on, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a big deal if it takes 20 minutes to schedule those 20,000 jobs. No one would complain about that. Yeah, I mean, and I think the same also applies to the other things that you mentioned, like things that time out. Um, that's all not a problem. You just don't time out, just say we're working on it, right? Um, and, and all that is sort of why, why we're doing this modernization on the back end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly the solution for the uh, massive copy history task that takes half an hour or whatever. I mean, it's also ridiculously inefficient in that uh, there is a whole lot of uh, one data set, flush, all the attributes get expired, we need to load them again from the database, and so on and so on. Uh, so that in itself can be faster, but again, I mean, there's a limit, and we should be doing this whatever, whatever it is we need to do this in, uh, in the background. Okay, and the uh, issue was like using, are we is our goal to keep on going using the library and extend that or do we modify the history or I mean how does someone who has finds of like 40 gigabyte data set in the internet uh, how does he get it into galaxy or maybe 100 gigabytes how does he kind of is there a way to get it into galaxy as a user and even you know share it maybe I mean don't quite intentionally. I have to say, I, I didn't quite understand the problem there. Uh, well, there okay. was, so there's a max output job size, right? On main. That was, I don't know, 20, 40 gigs, something like that. Sam's mm -hmm. file was bigger than that. So f for him, we've got I mean, the a, size, setting, right? right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've got to have a limit somewhere. And for him, we bumped up the size to make it all work. But uh, what, yeah, what does a normal individual do when this, this sort of thing happens to them? <laughs> We could try to question. accept that just for upload and data source tools, I guess. But the goal, the, the point of that option was for, uh, we had people running joins that would just run forever and produce an infinitely sized data set until we ran out of space. Yeah. So it's just a check on what would be a reasonable. And, and when your quota is 250 gigs, granted, we give people up to a terabyte for, for uh, you know, temporary uh purposes but when your quota is only 250 gigs a 50 gig output is i mean maybe something uh that we could do which is somewhat intermediate difficulty is to say we give you half your quota size as maximum output or something like that because if yeah, you only cool. have, uh, yeah, i like yeah. Yeah, or I like maybe like idea. up to your remaining free space plus an extra amount yeah i mean as a as an easy first step just allowing the upload or ingress tools to bypass that to, to some much higher limit is seems reasonable yeah i mean assuming that those aren't going to be runaway jobs in the way the join always was i mean not they can right we've had people uh well, this hasn't happened in a long time, but uh, another case was people selecting stuff from the uh, UCSC that uh, would, you know, return entire tables. And I, I don't know if they've made some changes that prevent that, but hasn't happened or hasn't been an issue. Yeah, if that would work, like if I could have been able to upload as much as my quota is or half of it and if i wouldn't have the issue with the with the automatic unpacking of zip files um that would have been nice i would have noticed the difference even though we would still have made the improvements we made because they were extremely useful but still i would have been able to run the things uh, much smoother those two things i mean automatic unpacking and and being able to get the file in there 
How is the job size limit actually enforced, Nate? I guess. Uh, it actually probably only works on local runners, not Pulsar, but essentially it just, it, uh, any defined, it only works on defined outputs, but essentially it loops over outputs while the job is running and it'll terminate the job if any one of those grows larger than the limit. Okay. Also, yeah. Sam, just quick interjection, like you can upload zip files, right? You just need to say that they're zip files. They will not be unpacked. Oh, okay. It's, I mean, it's this trade-off, right? You, if you don't say what it is, Galaxy makes a guess. Okay, but yeah, that would be a solution. I thought I tried this. You're sure that they're not getting up? I mean, there are server settings that inference this, but like if you oh. do it on my local instance, it works fine. Let me just so we don't have like a, a pick, pick files to extract from a zip file tool though, right? So then if you go to extract it, you're just going to get everything dumped out of it, which is going to hit the up, the, the limit. That's right, but um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's right in the tool, so. Can yeah. do that. Sam, maybe you check that. I also got a bug report, so maybe that's actually a bug in 2101. I, I have a similar bug report with, with zip files and so on, so maybe we should check that again. Okay. I mean, also, um, I don't know. I, th I think a lot of the things you mentioned, there are already issues for it there, but we should maybe go through the list and see if there are some that are not. Yeah, I know there at least for the UI bugs, there are definitely issues for some of these, but absolutely, it'd be a great thing to go through this and put them on the wish list roadmap or, or something uh, to keep track of. I mean, you know, I, I, I think our bugs are well labeled, right? Yeah. Um, go to bugs, pick something. I mean, they're, they're all worth fixing. I, I, I try not to label things that I don't think should be fixed. So, like, John. I think a larger issue that we could maybe discuss in the remaining minutes is um, what Sam also mentioned that we have currently no no feature and probably maybe no idea how to actually get rid of complete histories, complete users forever in a in a hundred percent way. Um, I think Jen complained about that that her account is currently so big that she cannot use it and she really wants to get rid of complete histories and um, doing now the COVID monitoring where we really produce millions of jobs now which is fine and it scales nicely so that's cool I'm just worrying that I want to get rid of that in a few years and I cannot and it, it would be super cool if we can just drop the SARS-CoV-2 account at some point and also remove 10 million rows in our database to as, as an example. Um, and I think that's worse to investigate because I'm not sure. I mean, our users are using collections and large collections really heavily nowadays. Um, and they also try it. Or, I mean, they, they do exploratory research with that, right? So they create a lot of collections that are maybe useless and they, they get maybe bigger as they should be. Um, what I just want to say is that we need to have a mechanism to be sustainable, to really get also get rid of things in a database. Um, and this is what I'm a little bit scared with the COVID effort now. I mean, I, I'm happy to, to analyze now all these data sets, but essentially we will end up with 20 million jobs um, that I would like to get rid of somehow at some point. Um, and maybe we need to think about a strategy how to do that. Um, what we need to do to keep track of that in our database, um, because I don't think that's a super sustainable um, solution that we currently have, that we keep everything forever in the database. What about if we change what history purging actually does and transform it in actually purging everything? So the history, the data set from the database, Yes, if, but want, my if the person select I mean, purge, then it must be purge. Yeah, but my understanding is that this is actually a technical limitation. So I think even if I delete users permanently, they don't get rid. I mean, the, the user still exists in the database somehow, right? We overwrite. I mean, we we kind of replace a name with some random hash or something, but it's still in the database. So it still wastes space in the database with all the jobs. So I don't think we have it. I mean, Nate, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
I don't think we have a, a mechanism to really get rid of a user with all the associations or a history with all the jobs that are connected and so on. Yeah, that's right. In all the major tables, we don't we don't ever delete anything. We just mark as deleted. I mean, but that's that's a choice, right? I mean, it's sure yeah. it would be significant effort making sure nothing breaks, but it's also not impossible. Uh, right. How much space are we actually? So just given, I don't know, one, I don't know, come up with whatever random or arbitrary unit of work we want to talk about. But how much space are we talking about in a database for like one of the big COVID runs? I don't know. I, I, well, I don't even know how to calculate that. Okay. Um, but, yeah. But the point I, I, I might be able to come up with that. I, the the total main database is now over a half a terabyte, um, and most okay. of that is in the, the HDA table, I believe. Yeah. Um, I mean, also regarding slowness of you know the interface for people that have a lot of data sets. I mean, like. Um, you was doing fine, right? You create a new account and uh, you browse around, and you're amazed how far, amazed like how fast things really are. And I think a lot of that is because we do limit offset queries, um, and that's not super efficient when there is a lot of rows to skip over. And there are techniques we can use instead of limit offset. We could have a query set techniques. So you say, you know, you. You limit you, you only limit but you you um, you do a comparison on update time for instance uh, that should have much less impact in theory and I, I don't know if that's all that there is for things being slow but maybe that's something worth trying also make sure there's no what is our... what do you say make sure there's no missing indexes yeah, that, that one too. <laughs> but we have a script now, so we, sh we shouldn't be uh, creating that anymore. But That's I mean, what is, our, what is our plan for really getting rid of stuff in the database? But right? if people choose to remove their accounts, why do we keep that? So, and, and should we not investigate, maybe up with a proper test set at first, of course? that we can actually kind of really get rid of half of our users if, if that is needed. And then the database is also, again, not half a terabyte, maybe, maybe just 100 gigabyte. You, you could. Uh, one thing that that affects is if you need any kind of historical data for you know figuring out, oh, how many jobs, how many hours did we compute on this specific? It, it's less of a case for you probably, but like in my case, where at the end of each exceed, you know allocation period we have to go back and look at um you know what what how many jobs how many hours did we run on this cluster versus this other one and that kind of it's stuff also, um, so i mean, I mean we could always extract the stuff that we would think that we would need into into a separate database i i don't think i'm justifies keeping everything it's still we'll, we'll come up with some number but just... we could also look at what columns are really worth uh deleting I mean, there are some columns that are heavier than others um, and that maybe nobody needs to look at anymore. Yeah, like you just saw the peak was, yeah, yeah. Yep, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That, yeah, that took up much more space than I expected. The problems with uh, deleting users and data sets is, you know, if they shared anything that can be shared with another person, another person, and then, you know, deleting one of these records, you could leave something hanging over and it's just, it's not that you can't. But we do kind it, of solved that already, right? Because you know, there's so. I mean, we do some kind of reference counting with the data sets. So I think, uh, I mean, it's not trivial, but it's doable, right? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a bit of work, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Nate, what you said about historical uh, data about what happened in the past, it doesn't have to be the same data database which we use for running jobs now it could be some kind of data warehousing effort and just put it there a certain breakpoint and use it for reports from the past and purge everything from the current database which we use for live stuff yep yeah i agree we definitely could do something to move it out of band
Okay, I think we've gone over time. So I'm gonna stop the recording. Uh, thanks so much, Sam. Thanks so much for the yeah. great conversation, everyone. It was really yeah. awesome.